Welcome everybody to the um, IET sponsored public lecture that's part of um, Taros 2021. Um, thank you to everyone who's joined us on, um, on the Zoom channel from the conference and everybody who's on YouTube, welcome. Great to have you with us. Um, so it's my great pleasure to introduce um, Nick Hawes, Associate Professor um, of Engineering Science at Oxford, part of the Oxford Robotics Group, um, Tutorial Fellow at Pembroke College and Group Leader for AI and Robotics at the Turing Institute. So lot, lot of, lots of awesome achievements and you know, awesome titles there. Um, but in addition to that, or, or maybe more, more so than that, what I think Nick's doing is the kind of critical thing that we need for robots to be able to really reach their potential. So we're good at doing kind of low level control of robots, right? We are good at getting, you know, getting robots to know where they are and interact with the world and navigate around. But what we haven't yet really figured out is how to get them to do the kinds of things that people do in the sense of, you know, high level, you know, go to this place, do this thing, and then do this other thing. And how do you do all that and connect all that stuff up and keep doing it for, until I tell you to stop, right? And in my head, at least, that's exactly what Nick does. It's this big unsolved problem, and he's doing great work on it, which he's going to tell us about. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, Simon. That's, that's the best introduction I think I've ever had. So uh, I'm, I'm slightly flushed. I'm, do, I'm doing my job, at least. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Thank you. Right, I'm going to share my screen. and I'm going to jump to this. Is everything visible and working? Looks good to me. Yeah. Excellent. Cool. All right. Thank you, Thea. Thank you for the, for the introduction, Simon. Um, and, and thank you uh, to the, the Taurus organizers uh, for inviting me into IET for, for sponsoring this talk. It's a great honor to be invited. Um, I've, I've attended Taurus myself many times. I think it's a great conference for the UK to have and a great way of bringing uh, the UK community together. Um, so yeah, as Simon hinted at, I work on um, the problem of what we call mission planning. So deciding on a sequence of actions that a robot can perform in order to achieve its goal. And I'll, I'll say a lot more about that as we go on. But also just to, to kind of give uh, the people watching some context, uh, this, is, this is designed to be a, a, a publicly accessible talk. So uh, I'm not going to do anything too technical. So if you're here, you know, if you're here as a robotics PhD student or robotics uh, academic uh, and you're expecting technical content, then I'm, I'm sorry to say there won't, won't be very much technical content. But I will hint at probably my general philosophy for how we can build better autonomous systems that can do the kind of things that Simon said. So operate for long periods of time and achieve the kind of goals that we want our robots to achieve for them. Um, but for the, for the kind of more general audience, I'll spend certainly the first half of the talk kind of just trying to justify why we need to think about uncertainty and probability when we're building robots that plan to act in real world environments. Uh, and then from there, I'll kind of build up after I give you a bit of a general background for the way to sort of think about this sort of problem. I'll give you a couple of examples of robotic systems that we've we've built and how they kind of use this general approach to make decisions uh, when performing missions in, in that world. So that's the, the, the general scope of things. Um, we, we need to be wrapped up by, by seven. Um, so I will, I mean, I might, I'll probably stop a while well before that, take questions. I'll also probably stop and, and take questions as we go along. Uh, so one of the great kind of parts of, of doing these things online is that we can be a bit flexible with the format. And because I'm stood in my own home, I feel very informal. So I'm willing, well, I'm, I'm always happy to be informal, but we can we can take that into this talk and I can stop and take questions as we go. So please, if you're a, in the uh, attendees list on Zoom or whether you're on YouTube, you can, you can post your comments or your questions into the appropriate boxes on those platforms. And I, whilst I can't see any of them, I'm pretty sure Simon and Mark can, so we can also stop and take questions um, as we go there. So, so please do, do post questions, comments as we go. Okay, so um, yeah, let's, let's get into it. So I, I thank Taros and, and, and IET. I'd also like to thank uh, the various sponsors of the projects and the people that have worked uh, that have contributed to the work I'm going to talk about. So this is kind of UKRI and, and various projects and subsidiaries under them that have supported a lot of our work, particularly focused on robotics in the nuclear domain and robotics in the offshore oil and gas domain, uh, but also some kind of more long-term sponsors of our work. So AWS, Accenture, Honda, and as Simon mentioned, the Turing Institute um, have all, all contributed to, to helping uh, this work exist and, and allow us to kind of make progress on some of these interesting topics. So thank you to all of those uh, people. And also thank you to my, my wonderful group. So uh, 
as in almost all academics, the people stood up talking in these kind of settings are not the people that do a lot of the actual hard work, hard thinking, programming, experimentation, carrying robots to places, um, doing the maths. You know, this is all done by the wonderful postdoc students, uh, engineers that, that support uh, or that work with me uh, in the Oxford Robotics Institute. And in particular, within my research group, which is the Goal Oriented Autonomous Long Live Systems Group or Goals Group for short. Uh, and the reason it's called that is because we want to allow a robot to achieve their goals under uncertainty. So a big thanks to all these people too. And actually that's kind of where we're gonna transition into the, the contents of the talk. So um, we work in my research group on what we call mission planning. Uh, and the statement here kind of summarizes the kind of things we're interested in. So we want robots, or we want to develop algorithms, uh, which we call mission planning algorithms, which are techniques that allow long lived autonomous robots to achieve their goals under uncertainty. And uh, it's probably worth unpacking that a little bit. So the first thing is we want to build systems, robots that are autonomous. So autonomous means that they have some control over their own destiny. And this is only in a very limited, narrow sense. But these are robots that can make decisions about where they go, how they get there, maybe what to observe when they get there, perhaps what to carry, what maybe what even tasks to do. But autonomy means it's quite a narrow autonomy we're interested in, in, in robotics. And that is the ability to have some freedom in uh, the ability to behave in order to meet some, some goal. And I'll, I'll motivate why we need this a bit, a bit later on. And we also want these robots to be useful for us. Right? We, want, we want to build robots that can work with humans and work for humans in our everyday work environments. And when we think about that, what we really want is robots that we assign tasks to or goals to so that they can achieve those goals independent of, of, of our sort of specifications. So we, we don't tell a goal, we don't want to tell a robot, you know, drive 10 centimeters forward, rotate 10 degrees, lift, you know, move your arm this way. We want to say, robot, go and fetch my coffee or robot, go and see if, if Mark's in the office. Um, you know, we want to be able to task our robots or give our robots missions at that level of abstraction. And that's when we talk about goals, that's kind of what we're thinking about. In general, we'll talk about something, what we'd call a, a specification, which is this higher level sort of abstract description of what we'd like our robot to achieve on that mission. And that we can think about as their goal. And the final part of this statement, which is going to dominate a lot of the talk and, and really sort of yeah, pervades our thinking in, in our research group, is that they have to do this while managing the uncertainty that is present in their environment and the uncertainty that's present because they are a lump of metal and plastic and electronics uh, moving around in a world that they poorly understand. So these robots are very impoverished in terms of their ability to sense the world and understand the world. Um, they're just, you know, glorified camera phones, effectively. Um, and really, you know, that level of ability to perceive and understand the environment means that everything that's happening around them is very hard to predict, it's very hard to understand if you are a robot. Uh, and so the uncertainty is key to what we do and managing that uncertainty when trying to have these kind of lofty goals of long term behavior, missions to achieve interesting goals. Managing that uncertainty is key. Otherwise, the robot easily gets kind of blown off course by the dynamics of the, the real world. Oh, so let's let's start by, by taking a step back uh, and thinking about so some of the topics I said there, so we want robots that work for humans. We want robots that kind of perform tasks that we want them to do. And if you went back 20 years and said, OK, you know, show me what we you know, what commonly is considered robots working for humans or robots performing useful tasks. I think the most common answers would be around manufacturing, perhaps car manufacturing or other forms of production, production line automation. And these are really, really impressive machines. So the kind of robots we see here, so robot arms, conveyor belts, kind of spray guns. This is really, really kind of high precision engineering. But what we see here is an entirely controlled world. So as someone that's interested in artificial intelligence and autonomy, these worlds don't interest me too much. Uh, and what's going on here is we want to be able to automate the production in, in these kind of um, settings. To automate something, what you need to have is a kind of environment in which the automation takes place and a system you're trying to automate. So that would be the robot in this case. And the easiest way to perform automation is just to write a script. 
So if you think back to what we don't really want to do when we task our robots, what, what I describe as what we don't want to do when we task our robots, is you know write down exactly the amount a robot arm needs to turn or a base needs to move or how much a wheel needs or how much power needs to go to an actuator. Um, we don't want to write that, it's, it's time consuming, but it is actually incredibly effective if the world around the robot is entirely static and entirely predictable. So if the world never ever changes, you can write this script that tells the robot how to move all its joints and you can press play on the script and the robot can execute that incredibly fast, incredibly accurately, 24 seven, generating this you know, incredibly high throughput through your manufacturing setting. And, and, and you know, this is kind of the dream of robotic automation. So to do that, the world has to be predictable. And so when you see scenes like this, you see big screens and cages uh, to keep the humans separate from the robots. Now, you do this not because, well, I mean, we do this because we want to keep humans safe, right? These are big machines, very powerful. If a robot arm in one of these places hits you, you very much stay hit. Um, but really, the reason humans are kept separate is much more of a commercial uh, imperative. Uh, we want to stop the humans bringing in their constant you know, entropy and chaos. So humans come into places and they move things, they change things, they pick up tools and they put them back in slightly different places. They leave doors slightly ajar. And even those kinds of minute changes can throw off an you know, a high precision automation process or a high precision robotic process. Um, and so that's you know, one of the key reasons that we keep humans out of these settings, right? We keep them out of these settings for safety, but we keep them out of these settings because in order to, to do kind of scripted automation of the kind we see here, the world around the robot needs to be entirely fixed and entirely predictable. Without that, you cannot simply script uh, robot behavior. So this is kind of what led to a lot of success in robotics in the past. And a lot of robotic engineering and kind of processes came out of this world. But that's not where, where the future is. So ultimately, as, as people working in the field of autonomous robotics and or robot systems, AI, we want to take our robots into new, interesting, challenging, dynamic domains. Now, none of the things I'm showing here, these are, these are four videos um, of interesting robotic applications, and none of them are kind of science fiction. They're all things that are kind of either here today or are kind of going to be a commercial reality in the very near term. So we've got uh, autonomous driving uh, in the top left. We've got uh, warehouse automation in the top right. But this isn't kind of Amazon uh, or Ocado style warehouse automation where the entire place is purely staffed by robots. These are robots for a company called Magazino. Ooh, recording stopped. Um, okay, I'll keep going. Uh, I assume everyone's still there. <laughs> you still there, Mark or Simon? Yeah, no, we're here. Don't okay. worry, just keep cool. going. Okay, excellent. Um, so uh, yeah, th these are these are robots in warehouses where humans can also walk in and put a box on a shelf. Um, so these are the ideas of having kind of cobots or collaborative robots that operate in the same spaces uh, where humans can operate in the same space as robots. And as I said, like humans operating in these spaces are not following the same levels of prediction or predictability that a robot would. And so those boxes can end up at different angles, at different heights with the lid slightly on or off. Uh, and so the robots are operating in a much more dynamic space than in the, the, the car factory, although it doesn't appear that maybe to the untrained eye. Um, at the bottom left, we see a, a boss and over robot. So this is a robot that's taking stock, it's counting stock or monitoring or imaging stock on the shelves of supermarkets. These robots are designed to work in populated supermarkets around humans. Uh, they have to be able to avoid other customers or, or they have to be able to avoid customers. They have to be able to respond to, you know, people putting out a new floor display of toilet roll or cans. Uh, they have to be, you know, as you see here, they have to be safe and reliable around untrained naive humans and in the bottom right we see kind of a really exciting uh, application of autonomy which is in kind of mining and construction you've got these huge heavy dangerous machines in environments that people kind of have never seen before so a supermarket entirely you know you go to a bunch of supermarkets they all look fairly similar the kind of way that earth moves mines move when you're kind of quarrying and things like this it's incredibly dynamic but in a different way 
uh, and things can change online and you want your, your, your trucks, your diggers to move safely around these spaces. So all these worlds are kind of real, realistic applications of robot technology, but within them is variability. The worlds change. Uh, that might be because there are other people, other things in the world, other cars, other shoppers, and they move around these worlds such that the worlds are dynamic, right? The world is not entirely static. Or it could just be that the kind of the nature of that environment is incredibly hard to predict or, or kind of describe in advance. So typically when we deploy a robot somewhere, when we take a robot into these environments, we want to have some kind of model of the space, some kind of 2D or 3D model of the world, some kind of map. And if you're doing something like mining or perhaps construction, you can't even get that map in advance because the world will be different every time you visit it. So these are the places we want to go with these robots. And hopefully I'm giving you a sense of the challenge. The challenge here is the dynamics, the unpredictability, the fact that the robot cannot know in advance everything that is present, where it is present and how it will behave. This leads us to the need for autonomy. Okay, Autonomy, the ability to make decisions online that change how you act as a system, is utterly essential in these robotics domains because the only way a robot can understand the way its world is changing, what's present in its world, where the shoppers are in the supermarket, the only way it can understand that is through using sensors as it's acting. It has to use sensors to help it measure its environment. Those sensors may be cameras, they may be lasers, infrared, sonar, maybe touch, maybe pressure, sound, right? These are all ways the robot can measure things about its environment and use those measurements to, to perform some kind of perception. And that perception will inform the robot about some way the world is configured and that way it's configured should change the way it acts. So there's quite a long pipeline here that leads up to robot action, but the need for being able to change your actions, change your plans online, comes from the fact that in a robotic domain such as these, the robot doesn't know what kind of world exactly it's going to experience till it gets there and opens its eyes until it starts perceiving the world around it. Only then does it know really what the right thing to do is or the right way to act is. So just to kind of ground this out, imagine you're a robot going from, you know, you have to look at every shelf in the supermarket to count the stock. If you don't know where there's a blockage in a corridor, where there's a new toilet roll display, you can't plan in advance. You have to start driving. And only when you, in, you encounter that blockage, do you know, you know, there's a blockage there. No one's told you in advance. You have to experience it for yourself. And then you want to be able to change your behavior online in order to best perform your task given what you've observed. And that for me is the key driver for autonomy and for mission planning being part of the robot's behavior. The robot has to plan or change its behavior online to cope with these dynamics while still acting in a goal-driven manner. So that's kind of the basis of, of, of the motivation for the work that, that we do in my group. And I just wanted to kind of sum that up and kind of get us all on the same page before I move on and explain how we do it just a, just a little bit. So this is just really the potted version of, of the kind of hand wavy excited uh, spiel I gave you a, a second ago. So a robot uses its sensors to perceive the world around it in order to decide how the world appears, what state the world's in. And in general, we talk about the way the robot internally represents the outside world, we refer to that as a model. So a model in this sense, you can think about it as having a scale model of the real world, right? The robot in its head has got this tiny construction site or tiny supermarket with lots of little people moving around. Um, but that's just a computational artifact that the robot has to create and maintain as it acts. So as the robot acts in the world, it's maintaining this model that describes where it thinks all the people are and where it thinks it is in the supermarket or in the, the quarry, okay? But that, that model's essential for it to be able to understand and make decisions. But that model is inherently limited. There is no way that that model will exactly match the real world. The robot sensors are reading at some fixed frame rate, typically. That might be five times a second, that might be 30 times a second, that might be once a minute, depending on what kind of sensors we're talking about. And all of that sensor information is processed through all sorts of algorithms, all sorts of abstractions, 
that have to try and make sense of the noisy mess around the robot. And that means that the robot's model is inaccurate. It's limited. It's also limited by its field of view. A laser might reach 20 meters. A camera sees what's in front of the robot. So the robot is this device that's situated in the world with a limited field of view, a limited range of view, and actually a limited ability to understand. Okay? If, if the robot sees images of someone reaching up to get something off a shelf while they're shopping, the robot doesn't know what that person's going to do with any sort of precision. Probably the person's going to pick the thing up and put it in their, in their trolley, but they may take it and look around. They may do something else. Okay? The robot needs that information, but cannot have it. Okay? So the, the robots are building Typically, robots in their kind of heads, in their, in their software, have to build and maintain models of the environment in order to enable this kind of autonomy and the behavior we're interested in. But those models will always, always be incomplete and limited in worlds that are complex and dynamic. Now, we could do this in the factory automation world, right? We could build a perfect 3D replica of a world that's static and incredibly well known. But in the driving, in the supermarkets, in the, in the warehouses, we cannot do this. And the result of this is that when a robot decides to act, when a robot decides to move from one location to another or pick up something off a shelf or, or shovel some gravel into a, into a bucket, the result of performing those actions, the result of moving the robot's motors in the real world, cannot be fully known in advance. Okay, that when the world is uncertain and the robot's experience of the world is limited, what it can't know is what's going to happen next with 100% certainty. And this is key for me. So I'm interested, as I said, in, in a robot kind of stringing together a sequence of actions to achieve some goal. But now what I'm telling you is that when the robot performs that action, when a robot tries to achieve its goal, it may not always reach the kind of configuration or the state of the world that it thinks it should. So in the example that I gave when the robot's driving down the supermarket aisle, it thinks it should be able to reach the other end. So its action, its model of the world says, OK, I can drive down supermarket aisles and I'll arrive at the end. But if the robot hasn't perceived a blockage or someone suddenly comes around the corner pushing a trolley very quickly, the robot might get halfway up the corridor and its sensors go, actually, you can't move forward anymore. You can't move forward any further. And so it had planned an action using its model to say, I will move up this corridor. It tries to perform the action and the limits in the model and the limits in its perceptions mean that the outcome from that action of moving up the corridor is not the one it expected. So the robot's actions or more, more correctly, the effects of the robot's actions cannot be determined in advance fully. The robot might have a good idea about what often happens, but it can't know for sure what will happen in interesting dynamic domains. So this leads to the, the sort of conclusion um, that I've, I've been building to, and the conclusion we take in, in my research group's work, is that a robot should plan its behavior in advance. So a robot should know what it's going to do before it starts acting. The robot has to be able to look ahead and decide how to achieve its goal. But it, the robots should do that in a way that allow them to, to consider the various things that might happen and manage the uncertainty that comes from those various possible outcomes. So what we want the robot to do is actually model the different possible futures that could come, that could occur based on the actions they're taking and model the different types of kind of uncertain, well, let's say model the different types of outcomes with different uncertainties. In fact, different probabilities and act using that uncertainty. So that's the, the pitch for the work we do. A robot could just say, look, anything could happen and I'll act as if anything could happen. The robot could say, you know what, I'm just going to assume this one thing's always going to happen and I'm just going to reconsider if it's wrong. But what we want to do is say, you know what, we're going to model, we're going to include in our model the uncertainty, the quantification of that uncertainty using probabilities to say, you know, different things could happen with different probabilities. And I'm going to adapt my behavior to, to reflect that I know something about the probabilities of the way the world's changed. 
So if I'm a robot in that robot in the supermarket and I know the probability that that aisle may be blocked, for example, if I know the probability that aisle is much more likely to be blocked at uh, 5 p.m. on a Friday than it is at 2 p.m. on a Friday, then maybe I change my behavior based on the time of day to go through that aisle when I think it's more likely to be free. Doesn't mean it's definitely gonna be free. I just change my behavior such that I, I, I'm, I'm using the information I have contained in that probability. So my actions are more likely to be successful at the time of day that my model tells me the probability of, of meeting an obstruction is low. Okay, and that's gonna lead us to what we do and how we think about the rest of the talk. So what we do in, in, in mission planning under uncertainty, and actually what we do in a huge amount of autonomous robotics uh, in general, is we first, in almost any problem, we try and quantify the uncertainty that's present. And to quantify the, the uncertainty, we, we typically use the laws of probability. So if you've done any math that involves tossing coins or rolling dice, you understand probability. And the probabilities that our robots use is almost everything that you learn at, at, at the secondary school about probability. There's not a lot more in our probability theory than, you know, well, there's nothing important really uh, that you didn't learn at school uh, in the probability theory our robots use, except for maybe Bayes' rule, because I don't think they teach that at school, maybe, maybe further maths at some point, but that's about all you really need to know. So the robots kind of count the different outcomes and, and see how many times they occur. And, and there you go, that's your, your uncertainty, that's your probability. We're gonna take that uncertainty and we're gonna put it into a model of the system. So this is the kind of little pretend world that sits in the robot's head. Now, instead of being a model village, you can imagine this is kind of a, a superposition of lots of different model villages that could occur in the future. And though each, you know, each one of those different uh, models has a different probability associated with it. And that describes the kind of possible worlds the robot could reach when it acts in this uncertain world. Then on top of that, because we want to do this mission planning, we want our robots to achieve goals, we're going to give an algorithm, the model, plus a formal specification of the outcome we'd like the robot to achieve, the goal we'd like to robot, the robot to achieve. And then out of that algorithm, out of that mission planning algorithm, what we're going to get or what we're going to ask our algorithm for is a, uh, a policy. So a policy is going to be a computational artifact. Again, it's going to be something that sits inside the robot. And the policy simply tells the robot if your model of the world or if, if the world as you observe it now looks like this, e.g. there's a blockage in the corridor. If your world looks like this, then this is the next action you should perform. So the policy is a lookup table that says, when your world looks like this, here is the thing that you should do in order to achieve your goal, achieve your specification, given the uncertainty I think the world contains. Okay, so that's the big picture. The next thing will be an example, but I might just pause for a second and see if there are any questions that I could answer that are related to the first bit of the, the talk. I actually don't know how to do this, so I'm going to wait for Marcus Simon to pop up. If they don't pop up, I will carry back on. I don't think we have any questions yet, Nick. But, okay. uh, somebody may correct me. I've got a, a ton, but I'll keep those for later. Yep. Okay, okay. All right, so this is the big picture. Let's go into an example. Uh, and I'm going to use an example from one of the videos we saw earlier. So the, these kind of mining robots, construction robots. And this is a this is a real life industrial optimization problem that people have tried to to solve with mission planning techniques to control autonomous robots. And it's thanks to uh, um, a colleague around Missouri at the University of Birmingham. She brought this to our attention, and we worked on 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 some work with her jointly when she was at Orebro in uh, Sweden. Uh, and so this is a problem that we we, we ended up writing a paper on. Um, and I think it's a really cool example of the kind of uh, sort of in the general space of problems that we're interested in. So our problem is to decide how this robot should act. This robot is what we call a, an autonomous ground vehicle. In fact, we'll call it a hauler because it hauls gravel around a, a quarry. Uh, and the robot's main job is to receive gravel from the primary loader. So the, the primary loader puts, this is also gonna be autonomous. It's gonna load some rocks or some gravel onto the back of the hauler. And that's gonna take one unit of time. Okay, so after one time step or one unit of time, we're gonna, 
in general, when we do this, we divide our world up into time steps. Each action might take one or more time steps. And then it's going to drive around the site. It could choose to drive to a secondary loader. So the secondary loader can also put uh, yellow rocks on, and that takes um, one, uh, one time step as well. The primary load puts these kind of peachy rocks on the back of the robot. And then it's going to drive over to an unloading station where it tips out all the rocks into some, uh, some kind of processing plant. Uh, and at that unloading station, what's happening really in the business process is that's turning gravel into reward or gravel into money. And so if the robot unloads the primary load, we get 10 units of reward, which is gonna be our kind of proxy for whatever goodness we care about in the system. And if we unload the secondary load, we get six units of reward. So we can get a maximum of 16 units of, of, of money substitute in this task. And the world is going to be divided up into a little bit of a graph. So the robot doesn't just drive where it wants, it follows a roadmap. So we can go via A to the secondary loader. And each one of these edges in the graph, so each one of these black arrows, uh, corresponds to some driving actions. And we'll just assume they all take one unit of time as well. And then there's a whole kind of road network or kind of transit network that describes where the robots can drive in this space. Okay, so driving takes one unit of time on any edge, loading takes one unit of time. And for every item of gravel you unload, that also takes one unit of time. So if I unload two things, it takes me two time steps. So this is our model, okay? This is our first pass at a model for the world, okay? It's not 3D, it's not got people running around. It just describes the actions a robot can perform, which is load up, drive or unload. And it describes the environment in which they can occur and how long it takes. And then we give ourselves a mission specification. So the mission specification in this chance is not really about a goal to reach somewhere. Our goal is slightly more abstract, slightly more uh, capitalist in this case. It's to maximize the reward possible given some time available to the robot. So we're gonna tell the robot how long you can drive around for. And then we're gonna ask our mission planning system to produce a policy that maximizes the reward the robot can gather given that time available to it. Um, so for example, we could say the robot has six time steps in which to complete its mission. And by complete its mission, we mean actually to arrive back at its initial state. So we're going to imagine the robot com like continuously performs these tasks and arrives back at its initial state. So we're going to say if the robot's got six time steps in order to perform this task, how much reward can the robot get? Right? We want to maximize reward. So the question we can ask is what is the maximum value the robot uh, can achieve? And if we we're doing this in person, I'd certainly be asking you to put your hands up and tell me. Uh, but I can tell you, I'll just jump ahead because it's harder to do this kind of interactive stuff on Zoom, um, that if the robot has six time steps, then the best we can do is maximize reward and get 10 reward units. And the policy the robot follows can be visualized like this, the yellow arrows. Okay, the robot loads up, drives to A, drives to B, unloads just one, everything it's got, which in this case is just the primary load, and return to its base, and then it gets the reward for the primary load. Okay, so this is an example of a mission planning process. We've got a model, we've got our specification, which is maximize reward, we've produced a policy, and the robot will follow the policy. So it'll follow those yellow arrows around to, to gather reward. If we change the time bound and say, well, actually robot, now you've got nine units of time. How well can you do now? And our mission planning algorithm would look at the model it would compare different routes and it will find a policy that, create, that goes to visit the secondary loader and gathers 16 units of reward. Okay, so this takes exactly nine time steps. The robot drives around, gets both loads, unloads both loads, goes back to the base. So we can do that in nine time steps. Now, hopefully you can already see that, I mean, I'm not going to go into the algorithmic details, but there's a computation going on here. The, the mission planning algorithm has to compare the, the value of going to the secondary loader or not. There's only really one choice here, which is at A, do I go left or right? And really that's the main choice that's being examined by the algorithm. Okay, 
let's make our life more problematic. So we had a deterministic world before. Now let's make our world uncertain. Let's add in some probabilities. And one of my favorite types of probability in robotics is the probability of time changing, the probability of a duration when the robot acts. So now when the robot goes from the primary loader to A, instead of it always taking one time unit, let's assume that there is a probability distribution over the amount of time it takes, over the duration of the action. So that looks like this. This means uh, two times out of 10, the robot takes one time unit, two times out of 10, the robot takes three time units, and six times out of 10, which I don't think adds up. <laughs> oh, yes, it does. Of course, four, four, two, well, okay. My maths is failing me. I suddenly decided that I'd made a wrong example. Four to, six times out of 10, uh, the robot takes two time units. So the most likely outcome is that it takes two time units, but there's a chance it could get lucky and it's quick, and there's a chance it could get unlucky and it's, it's slow. So this is the way that we're quantifying the uncertainty of the, of the actions in the real world. We're throwing away all the details of why the robot might be faster or slower. Maybe there's gravel, maybe there's another vehicle on the path. We don't care about that. Our model is quite abstract and just captures the uncertainty over the quantity we care about. So what could we do now? Well, now we have to start asking questions about probability. This is where things get more complicated. So now we can ask ourselves for a given policy. So for a given choice of route that we made, what's the probability that I can get back within a particular time limit? So this graph now shows us that. The blue line shows for the policy that, that, that only collects the primary load, what is the policy, what's the probability of getting back at different times? So we can see that the probability of getting back by eight or nine is one. The probability of getting back in five time units is, is zero. And the probability of getting back uh, in six time units is, is 0.2. So you can effectively see the probability distribution that we had on that first edge appearing in the graph, okay? The distribution goes across these different uh, time steps. And that reflects the fact that there is uncertainty in the transition times. And therefore we can say, no longer can we say the robot exactly gets this reward. We have to talk about the probability of getting back within the time zone, the time limit. And that's where things get interesting. We're no longer talking about definite robot behavior. We're talking about uncertain robot behavior. We could do the same for the policy that corrects the, collects the secondary load. And here we can see that for, uh, you get the same sort of shape, right? The shape that we get of that curve is based on the distribution of times at that first edge. And that allows us to, to really start to think about a trade-off between these policies. So we might ask ourselves, you know, given the world behaves like this, which policy should the robot follow? Okay, which robot, you know, which policy should the robot follow? Because we've got a trade-off now, and this is present in all interesting robotic problems. We have to trade off two factors. How much reward can our system get? Okay, the blue line gives us reward of 10, the green line gives us reward of 16. But we also have to trade off the probability of getting particular outcomes. So the probability in the, in the blue case you know, we're much less likely, um, sorry, we're much more likely to get back to the base within a particular time limit. Whereas in the green line, it's gonna take us longer, uh, but even for, you know, if we're at nine time units or 10 time units, we can think about different reward versus probability trade-offs. So this is where things start to get interesting. We, we can think about choices in terms of the probability of different outcomes. And those outcomes are based on the behavior of the robot. So, Let's go back to here and let's make the, and, and sort of answer the question slightly differently. We looked at two, what we'd call deterministic, in fact, plans. They weren't policies. They were just a straight line plan. A policy, as I said earlier, allows the robot to look up what it should do based on the way the world appears. And that means our robot could actually drive to A and then look at its watch and say, well, how long does that take? If the robot's able to track the time, it can not only plan using the probability distribution, 
it can observe the effects of its action. It can look at its model and look at its world and say, ah, well, how long did I take? And if I was quick, okay, if I was quick, I can go up to the secondary load time bound. I can actually make a choice about where I go based on how, based, sorry, based on the outcome of my uncertain actions. So this is a key thing for us. We can plan in advance using our knowledge of the possible outcomes and the quantities they occur in. But once we've taken an action, in our models, we can typically observe the effects of the action and use that to make choices. So in this case, the robot can observe the effect of time passing and decide whether it should go the long route that gives more reward or the short route that gives less reward but gives it a better chance of getting back. So we can also now talk about what we call the expected reward of the policy. So the repo the, this policy that makes a choice no longer gets a reward of 10 or a, get a reward of 16. It actually comes up with a, a, a reward that is based on the probability of different outcomes. So you can think of this as the average reward that the policy produces, given the probabilities we know that are in the model. So this is like a weighted probability average or a weighted average, given the different outcomes that can occur. And so we can say that this policy uh, gives us uh, an expected outcome or expected reward of 11.2, which is how the math works out. Okay, so this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna give the robot the ability to act in this uncertain world, observe its outcomes, and then choose what to do next. And this kind of time-based uncertainty is really important for things like service robots. So for example, if you want your robot to navigate through an environment to reach, a, say, a reception desk to greet a VIP, you want the robot to know what time should it start moving. It should actually be able to kind of plan for the different kind of doorways and congestion that it might encounter. And therefore, it needs to model those kinds of probabilities and act effectively online using a policy. So that's exactly what we're doing with robots such as Betty here that are acting in dynamic office environments. There's another set of problems. I'm going to start, I might accelerate a little bit here because I spent a bit too long getting excited about, about mining robots. Um, we can go a bit further and we can say, you know what, not just one edge, but lots of edges, lots of roads in this map have uncertainty attached to them. And if, for example, we put a probability distribution up here and say this edge is also uncertain, it gets harder and harder for the robot to, to plan its behavior and produce a kind of a definite outcome. So things are getting more and more uncertain. And what that means in robotic applications and in mission planning is we have to really start being explicit about our trade-offs between the different objectives. So when we write a specification, when we give a robot a goal, we give it what we call objectives. Maximizing reward was one objective, but kind of secretly in this mission, we had a second objective, which was to return to the home base within a particular time limit. And these two objectives are kind of intention. I can raise my reward, but if I raise my reward, I sacrifice probability of returning home on time. And we can actually represent that graphically. So, what I can do is I can ask uh, uh, our software tools, and this is done with a, a, a tool from a collaborator called Dave Parker and, and colleagues at the University of Birmingham, which produces something called a Pareto Front. And a Pareto Front describes a space of policies that trade off multiple objectives. So here we can plot a range of different behaviors for the robot and ask, how do these policies change the different objectives? Okay, so each dot on this line is one choice of policy that the robot could follow. And the way you choose them is by asking yourselves, well, what's my appetite for risk? How much do I care about reward versus how much do I care about getting home on time? So if I'm more conservative and I really want to maximize the probability of getting home on time, then I look to the right of this graph, okay? As I get more certain about getting home on time, um, this is for a, for a time bound of 10. If I get more, as I get more certain about getting home on time, I, the curve drops down, which means I get less reward. If I really want to maximize my reward, then what I'm doing is I'm costing probability. I'm moving to the left of the graph. So this gives us a way of thinking about the trade-offs inherent in robot decision-making under uncertainty. So yeah, on the left, we're more aggressive. And we can use these kind of tools when we're thinking about 
robot tasks in high risk environments such as inspection in oil and gas or in nuclear. So this robot's driving around to inspect some targets, but there are also some risks in here from gas leaks, from uh, nuclear, from radiation sources, for example. We want the robot to trade off the risk of performing the mission versus the reward of observing targets in this environment. Okay, so I am not gonna pause and take questions. I'm gonna try and get through the rest of this in five-ish minutes, which I'm probably sure won't happen. Um, and then I'll stop to take all the questions at the end. So I've given you a, the kind of motivation. I've given you the kind of way we think about the world. So the way we model problems, the way we insert the quantified probabilities into the models, and then how we can, different ways we can think about choices over the behaviors that robots can display. So now let's just look at how we might use them. So the first project is a project called Strand. So Mark, who's been popping up on here, I don't know if you can see it on YouTube, uh, was a, a great collaborator within this project. Um, and here we deployed mobile service robots within real end user environments, so offices and care homes. And these robots drove around unsupervised by us engineers and computer scientists for months at a time, performing the kind of tasks we talked about. So visiting locations, greeting guests, inspecting things, keeping, taking people for tours. And we explicitly modeled the environment the way that I showed you on those previous slides. So this is a top down view of the robots model. The black and gray bits, and let me zoom back out again, the black and gray bits are kind of the map, the floor plan of the space. And we built this road map, this graph on top that told the robot where it could drive and where it can perform tasks and how to move through the space. And then these different edges, the, the, the lines in the graph correspond to ways the robot could move. And the locations corresponded to things the robot could do in the space, greeting people, uh, watching people, uh, searching for objects and things like that. And then what we did is we gathered statistics from the robot's experience. So as the robot drove around, it took particular durations to move between locations and it failed occasionally. It bumped into things. It got stuck behind, um, got stuck behind brushes. And so it wasn't always able to act in the way it expected. And that those, we got statistics from the data on the robot and we quantified it online to make models that the robot could use to plan. And what we did is we threw these into something called a Markov decision process. So this is the one technical slide in all of this. This is the way we think about the world. We think about the world moving on this graph of, of nodes and edges or states and actions. And we model them explicitly in a computational model called a Markov decision process. And that process models actions and their uncertainty. And we build this big Markov decision process that describes the way the robot can perform tasks in the environment. And we solve it for policies. And then the robots that are, are driving around in these videos are all following the policies that determine where they should drive on that graph. Okay, so the robot has a model of how long it's going to take to, for example, get through this doorway. This is uncertain because the robot has to wait for one of these lovely humans to open the door for it. And because it's done this a hundred times before, it can actually model how long it expects to wait. And then it can decide at what time of day do I think I'm going to be more successful going through this doorway, or maybe I should take another route through the building, or maybe I should do another task. So all of this is being done by quantifying the uncertainty that we get from experiencing the robot behavior in the world, and then capturing that data and modeling it. The model, as I said, was this big graph that we saw overlaid on the real world, and the robot is gathering statistics over that and planning its actions in that graph. So this is important for various reasons. One of the most important reasons was getting the robot to locations on time. This is a lovely example that the marketing's colleagues led uh, where we worked at a care home called uh, Haus de Baum Herzogite in, in Vienna in Austria. And the robot would assist nurses by leading what we would call a walking group. So helping the nurses lead a group of people walking around a site. But this walking group was part of the, the daily, uh, the weekly routines of the nursing staff I think 2 p.m. on Tuesdays and Thursdays was when this group happened. The robot was off doing other things throughout this day and had to drop everything it was doing and get to this location for those start times. The only way you could do that with high probability is by modeling all of its dynamics in the environment and planning with those models. So by modeling uh, the robot, the dynamics of the world, by planning with the uncertainty, we could make the robot more reliable in terms of turning up on time to assist the hardworking nursing staff and entertain some of the, the residents in this home. 
so the kind of long story is that you can make your robots more reliable, which makes them better and more useful kind of service agents. To jump to another example, the other one I hinted at in the slides, we're working in a, a national project called RAIN, which is looking at robots and AI for the nuclear industry. And we're working on robots such as the one you see here, which drive either manually or autonomously into radioactive, excuse me, radioactive environments. And in those environments perform inspection tasks. So using big, heavy kind of leaded uh, gamma detectors and spectrometers to, to measure properties of, of, of nuclear sites. The picture we see here is um, from one of our robots, which was driven around the outside of the jet fusion reactor in Cullen uh, near Oxford. And here we wanted to, to perform one of these trade-offs. So this robot here is driving around. This is not a nuclear site. This is a, a, just a mock industrial site. And the robot is driving around uh, to, to look at some inspection targets. And you can see down here, this is a map looking down on the robot's environment. The inspection targets these big colored disks. And we've mocked up some radiation, radiation sources, which are these uh, brown balls. So the, the bigger the ball, the more radioactive it is. The bigger the disk, the more valuable that target is. And this is actually a classic industrial inspection problem. The robot has got a fixed lifetime, a fixed battery lifetime. And within that lifetime, what we want to do is maximize the amount of value we get by inspecting the, the, the colored disks. But we also want to minimize the risk to the platform by minimizing radiation exposure. So here we want the robot to manage its behavior by coming up with a policy that trades off these two objectives. So um, we've seen the targets, we've seen the radiation sources. And what we're gonna do is the robot is modeling, given its map and its knowledge of the radiation sources, the effect on its own uh, model of driving for one of these edges. So again, we've got one of these topological graphs, but the robot now is not just modeling how long it takes to get across the graph. It's also modeling the expected dose of radiation it receives that goes across that graph. And we can model that with this, this bar chart up here. Uh, and we can think about these blue bars that show the probability of not exceeding a dangerous level of radiation. So we're modeling the risk to the robot and remodeling the reward to the robot, which is this red bar here. And what we can see is that as the robot drives, it's going to change these bars and it's going to make different decisions. And we're actually making decisions from a Pareto front like this. So again, we've got uh, more aggressive. Uh, on the left here, these are policies that dose the robot with radiation with high probability. And we've got more conservative policies on the right which have much lower radiation risk, but also yield much lower rewards. The robot looks at less, fewer targets in the environment. And typically what we do is we choose something which trades off a little bit of risk for a lot more reward. Okay, so we, we've got off this curve a long way. So we're not losing a lot of probability from one, but we've got a lot more reward. But it's still an open problem how you'd actually pick one of these to run on the robot. So, uh, I'll just show you one of these policies in action. And these are the sped up massively so we can see uh, what's going on. The robot is driving around. Occasionally the arrows will jump around. When the arrows jump around, that's because the robot is making different decisions because it's observing the amount of radiation dose it's achieved. And we can also see that as it's doing this, it's monitoring its exposure according to its model. So the robot's got its model. The model tells it how much radiation it expects. And if it gets lucky, it may not get as much radiation as the model says, and then it can do a bit more inspection. So it's exactly like the case of the, 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 the loader robot that we talked about earlier. The robot acts, its model tells it, you might get a lot of radiation or you might not get very much radiation. And depending on what it observed, it can choose, well, if I didn't get very much radiation, then I can go and see some more targets, or if I got lots of radiation, then I better get home before I get any more radiation. So this is a kind of direct application in, a, in, a, in an important industry uh, for the kind of techniques that we're talking about. And this is running on, on a robot here. Okay, we won't go into the details of comparing some of these policies. Uh, okay, I, I, hopefully I've, I've, I've covered enough to give you a sense of what we do. Just wanna wrap up at the end, just to go back and, and restate the, the points and then I'll take questions for however long you wanna ask me questions. So the key point of all of this is that for these autonomous robots, their view of the world is limited and that limited view of the world means that when they model their own behavior, that model is inherently limited and therefore the effects of their actions are uncertain. The robots can't predict everything that happens with 100% precision. And therefore there is uncertainty when a robot acts in the environment, uncertainty over radiation, over time, over what's gonna be in the way. 
we quantify that uncertainty into a model of the system and we combine that model of a system with some kind of specification. I've been quite loose on the word specification, but that describes what we want the robot to achieve in a particular mission. And then we throw that into an algorithm that produces a policy. And when you see these autonomous robots driving around, I hope they're all running policies that take into account the uncertainty, because if they do that, they're acting more optimally, more efficiently and more safely because they're considering all these possible outcomes and they're being rational because they consider the probability with which they occur. And that leads to better, more effective robot behavior, which is where we wanna go in these exciting domains uh, in the near future. All right. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, I am very happy to take questions. Yay. Yeah, I say indeed. I say cheers. <laughs> this ah oh, look, Zoom is brilliant in even removing the bottle. There we go. <laughs> cheers, um, Simon. You, you you are in charge, right? <laughs> well, you can be in charge if you want. I'm, I'm no, 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 you stay yeah, in charge. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, good. So I don't. I'm just checking out what's going on in what was going on on YouTube. I don't currently see any questions in the Q&A session for this, but I'm going to kick off in, in good chair style with, um, with an initial question, mm -hmm. um, which is, Nick, so the, the kind of models you described, and I, I appreciate you, have got, you didn't go into the sort of full technical detail because you, you were talking for a, for a more general audience, but so what, one of the things that is, is, is to me a really interesting question in this is that your kind of underlying model, the model you described, these Markov decision process models have a notion of, you know, the robot is in this state and then it transitions and it does something and moves to another state, right? Mm -hmm. So these, those of us who've, who do, you know, good old fashioned AI are very familiar with these sort of state, state and action transition models, right? And you can, you can overlay on uncertainty on that, right? So that there's a question about, okay, we are, um, you know, maybe you don't do exactly, you know, the sort of deterministic transition, maybe it's, it's sort of uncertain where you, when you take off where you end up, but th there's sort of still to some extent a notion of, okay, once I've done, at some point I know where I am, right? So there's this sort of underlying notion of, of some kind of, you sort of quantize the world into these states, okay? Mm -hmm. So one thing that's, that's interesting to me is, is in how you deal with the question of knowing basically where you're at, in order to know which of these things you apply, right? So, so how do you how do you kind of cope with that that kind of mismatch between a, for example, a continuous world that says, you know, the robots at a particular, you know, GPS coordinate, yeah. as again, you know, so so some, something where it's defined down to a very you know large number of decimal places, but you're you're dealing with a representation that's a bit broader than that. How do you kind of put things in the right box and know where things are as you're as you're executing things? Yep, yeah, it's it's a great question. Um, we. I actually, I, I wasn't, didn't push too hard on it, but in all of the examples, you saw a, a spatial structure, uh, which, which looked like a graph with nodes and edges. Um, yep. And for us working on autonomous mobile robots, so typically robots that drive around or fly around or walk around in, in, in these kind of environments, the space is paramount. Uh, and so we almost always start with this, with this kind of topological map of space. And typically, I must confess for a lot of the applications we do, there's a sense that being in a rough zone is typically good enough to perform the action. Um, okay. So we, we get the robot to particular locations. And then if you really care about high accuracy, a different process will take over. So we did some work of docking robots to charging stations, moving through doors, mm -hmm. picking things up. Then you, you typically switch to a different action to take over for that. The, the kind of general, how do you segment that space is something we tend to do manually and what we do is we, we use a lot of our own semantic and physical understanding and say, here are the locations we know the robot needs to do tasks. And these are, sorry, these are the locations where the robot needs to do tasks. And here are some decision points where the robot needs to, to, to move into different locations because of the task it's gonna do. And then we typically throw a, a kind of a broad zone around each of these locations and say, look, if you're within a meter or two of this, it's kind of fine. Um, there is some really interesting, that, and that allows you to get to like 80% of, of most of the applications we've ever cared about. There is some really interesting stuff that starts to happen when you look at radiation, for example. So radiation follows an inverse uh, square law, and there, 
a kind of 10 centimeters either way can really change the amount of radiation dose you get. Um, and so what we, we tend to do in those kind of situations is either kind of run a, a hierarchical process where we, we plan at this high kind of quite abstract level course actions. And then we, at a lower level, we have a finer grain segmentation of the space, uh, which will be done automatically by the robot based on its observation right there. So you can think of the robot online doing some kind of sampling or segmentation of the space based on properties it cares about. Uh, the, the other thing you can do is um, really just switch to a finer grain model in those areas mm. if that's what you care about. Um, but this kind of the, there is always an interplay in the work we do between uh, a discrete world and a continuous world. Uh, in general, we work in tasks where the discretization, but actually, I should probably stop. This is a very long answer. Discretization in space is often quite interesting, easy. Discretization in time can be can be slightly harder because what I, we haven't talked about here is everything running here is running asynchronously in 80 different threads or processes on a robot. So different things are popping into the robot's state at different times. And you have to also be able to judge how you're close to something in space as well as time. Um, and, and those can be, can be open issues as well. Cool, okay, thank you. I totally, I mean, I've, there are more things I would ask to follow up, but I don't want to derail things. And especially we've got a, we've got a question um, in the chat from Roger Moore asking, um, who says, I'll just read the whole thing. Um, so great overview, Nick, thanks. So the key idea isn't just incorporating uncertainty into planning, but also constant updating stroke replanning, right? Cool, that's, yeah, that's definitely not a question. Um, but hello, Roger, lovely, thank you for, for watching. Um, yeah, I, I think that's, that's absolutely where we're headed right now. So we, the way that I, so I, I should say that not, like planning under uncertainty is not new, it's been done for, for decades in the AI community. Um, and in, in particular on robots, it's, it's been important in robots. The way we've been really thinking about bringing this in is by thinking about particularly formal languages for specifying, for, for providing specifications, things like linear temporal logic, and this idea of, of, of the probabilities coming from models that you're learning online with the robot. In the work that I showed with the, the service robot in the strands example, there, the, the kind of loop between robot experience and planning was quite long the robot would rebuild its models overnight. At the other extreme, you've got something you know, very popular in the community like reinforcement learning, where you're updating your models after every single action. Um, and those are kind of two extremes for how you bring the uncertainty in. The, the thing we're trying to do at the moment where I think the real interesting work lies for us in the next five to 10 years, well, five years, it's not, I don't know what's gonna happen in 10 years, God. Um, the next five years is about modeling not only your uncertainty in your action outcomes, but modeling the uncertainty in your model. So now, instead of having, in the examples I gave you, we have point estimates for the probabilities. So I know that my, my probability is this, or I know that my duration is this. But in reality, if you're building these models from data using machine learning techniques, you also have distributions over your probability estimates. You have distributions over your duration estimates. And this naturally occurs when you start doing either reinforcement learning or you start incorporating kind of machine learning techniques into your model creation process. And if you don't take into account the, the distributions over your data, then you're not gonna act in a way that represents the true uncertainty in, in the models. So it's not just about bringing in from data, the real challenge is gonna start, it's starting to become, how do we accurately reflect the, the uncertainty we have over our uncertainties and over our models uh, in a way that allows you to still act uh, as close to optimal as you can. Good, thank you. Um, so we have another, another question here, which I'm, I'm gonna read out because I'm not sure how visible it is to people at this point. So a question from Charles Fox, um, who asks or who says, um, most of the tasks you showed could be proved NP hard to solve or even worse when probabilities are taken into account. How is robotics handling this problem and does it place fundamental limits on what robotics can do? So and I guess, I, I guess there, might be, there might be a quick, you know, this is what NP hard is for a general, <laughs> general audience, which I'll hand over to you. Let's just say <laughs> NP hard means it's going to take your computer longer than anyone wants to wait to solve it. And as the problems get bigger, they get even harder. So I'd like, I, I think the technical definition is it's not important here. It just yeah. means that as you add, so let's say a great example is the inspection problem. You've got, you know, 
uh, a target, you know, you've got 10 targets to visit. How do you choose which subset of those 10 targets do you visit? I think off the top of my head, that's kind of got factorial complexity, which is just awful um, or worse. Um, and it's an example of something called the traveling salesman problem. Uh, and that's in the deterministic discrete world. So we're dealing with uncertainty, so it absolutely gets worse. Um, th there's a bunch of different ways we deal with that. And something I've always done in pretty much every system I've built is to throw optimality out of the window. If you want to scale to big problems, you have to care, you, you have to not care about being optimal. There's lots of sleight of hand that goes on in robotics or in pl probabilistic planning, which is to deal with the expected utility, the expected case all the time. Um, and that's actually a, a thing that makes it a lot easier to solve some of these problems, even when there are probabilities. But the interesting thing for me is the expected case kind of deals with this perfect average of your model and the robot never experiences the expected case. The robot only experiences the things that actually happen in the world, which never match the expectation because that's kind of in some sense fiction. So, uh, sorry, that's a bit of a, a, a sidetrack. So what we do is we, we, we abstract, we use hierarchical planning processes, we embed some of the complexity elsewhere, we use heuristics, we use, uh, when we throw away optimality, we, we use time horizons and just look about being optimal over the next time, 10, 10 time steps. Um, we use sampling based approaches that are just kind of probably approximately correct or, you know, within some delta of optimal. So we do in, in robotics, we do what everyone else in the AI community does. Various forms of abstraction, sampling, uh, heuristics. Cool. And, and we, we don't take on more than we can chew. <laughs> so all of, all of these models are handcrafted, right? All of the problems are dealing with environments that are just big enough to be interesting, but not so big that we can't solve them. Yes. Yeah, good. Sorry, I was going to follow up with that, but I'll, I'll, I'll do the right thing and, and move on to the next question, um, which is from Mark Hanhide um, asking, do you know if modern sat-nav systems are using probabilistic route planning like you presented, things like Google Maps, TomTom and so on, and then, you know, couldn't they allow me to choose a risk, i.e. sacrificing they, they guarantee arriving at a certain time against uh, the trade-off being hoping to arrive earlier? Uh, so I, I don't believe they are. I, uh, we, we did some work with a company a few years ago at Birmingham with Dave Parker, where we, we actually worked with a, a company doing this. We, so we have patents pending on this idea. Um, and I think it's a fascinating one. The problem is, is how accurate are those probabilities gonna be? Because your, the, the, the planning problem is huge, right? It, the kind of, the, the worlds we looked at had um, 100 kind of nodes, you know something close yeah. to that edges if you want to plan to get from here to edinburgh you have to start what you have to start doing is to make the planning problem tractable to to do the, un, the un, planning under uncertainty right you're trading off you're doing multi-objective stuff because you're trading off uh you know typically duration versus risk so those planning problems are super hard anyway to make the planning problems tractable you have to build more and more abstract models and as you build these more and more abstract models the accuracy of your risk guarantees go starts dropping away and so there's a real tension when you start scaling these things up to kind of sat nav levels that to solve the problem in a way that a user can get you know an update within a couple of seconds to solve it at that scale the, the guarantees really start to start to become meaningless i would say um, but i i think currently there no one's really doing it at that scale i think it would be really interesting to do it there's, yeah. a, there's an interesting thing in the in the in the community around model checking, um, and and kind of so what model checking for those of you, <laughs> we've gone very technical in the questions, but for, for those of you not from this background, uh, model checking is the the field of theoretical computer science that kind of looks to evaluate properties of policies or models. So if I've got a policy and I want to know my probability, I can do something called model checking, which effectively looks at the policy and compares all the probabilities and gives me a number at the end. It's a lot cheaper to model check a policy than it is to synthesize it. So if you could, if you can produce a policy of, of your your sat nav route, you can get some of those probabilities out quite cheaply. So it doesn't seem. I think it's reasonably, you know, it's much more tra tractable to be able to come up with three different routes through whatever, you know, A star Dijkstra thing you're doing, and then you know throw them into a model checker to get probabilities, and just add mm -hmm. that as an extra thing in your in your kind of vector of decision-making uh, variables that you show to the user, um, it's a lot harder to plan in that space. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, um, 
I'm just going to point out that that actually that said that Mark's question ended up being you know the counter example to part of your answer to Charles's question, right? So you were saying, well, what we do is we try to we try to engineer these worlds, right? But but, but that's an example of a world where you know you there's well certainly certainly the problem is it exists, right? The sort of standard sat nav representation, whatever, is does easily lead you into situations which are just too big to be able to do the things that you want to be able to do to them. Yeah, the, the interesting part of that as well is that it's hard to know in advance which abstraction is interesting. Right. Is it the motorway journeys that cause me the greatest risk or is it the traffic lights or the school around the corner? You know, do I, because you can, you know, lots of AI you know, work has been around decomposition and finding these right structures, but yeah. it's, it's never immediately clear how to decompose some of these larger problems in ways that maintain, that keep the information in the right places. Right. Yeah. yeah. And just and, and the other piece, I think, with that is it's, it's really it's then really difficult to um, sort of just thinking about the, you know, there's a lot of um, interest and, um, you know, research these days around um, the idea of explainable AI. Right. So the idea that you could go to your planning system. But why exactly did you choose to do this? Yeah. Right. And in systems like that, there's, it's very hard to come up with the right abstraction to give people. Right? So there's kind of like the computationally right abstraction for the particular algorithm you're using to solve it. But then if you if you use that as a basis of an explanation, you feed that back to somebody, it's often something that makes no sense. It's like, well, this this you know, this this edge has a weight of 3.2. Yeah. And you're sitting there going, what? <laughs> you know, makes no sense to me. So yeah, there's it's a whole other level of representation that's kind of needed for. Mm. I mean, I, I would I would argue a little bit that the, the Pareto front, whilst it's a bit abstract, is a nice way of starting to think about that. It doesn't necessarily tell you why you chose one action or the other, but if you're describing your behaviour over a longer mm -hmm. period, you can say, look, someone, someone turned the dial to conservative or someone turned the dial to aggressive. So in that space, in, in the space of, of explainable AI methods, I like the idea of saying, effectively, I chose a particular weighting for my, for my different objectives, and that, that explains why I'm taking this road rather than this road or this, you know, this action rather than this action. But yeah, you, that's still at quite a high level of abstraction. Yeah, cool. Good. Thank you very much. So I think we've we've kept you on, Nick, far longer than, you know, you agreed <laughs> in the original terms of the of the talk. So I think it's time to for all of us to say thank you very much. And those of us who have access to a microphone can...